Welcome to our YouTube video about tight adaptive reprogramming in the quantum random oracle model. This is joint work with Alex Grillo, uh, myself, Andrea Sulzing, and Christian Mayens. So to say a few words about the quantum random oracle model, I'd start with the random oracle model, which is um, very popular because it allows for simple proofs of efficient constructions, but it suffers from the drawback that it cannot take into account quantum attackers. And this is why 10 years ago, uh, the random oracle model was generalized in such a way by allowing the random oracle to be accessible via uh, superposition queries or in short quantum accessible. And uh, a proof in the quantum random oracle model allows to argue security against quantum attacks that are run in classical networks, meaning interacting with honest users that are still classical. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, why this is very neat, uh, because it allows to argue post quantum security, it comes with its own challenges. Uh, quantum access, meaning superposition queries, uh, add proof complexity and um, very useful random oracle properties like programmability and pre-image awareness um, are not uh, trivially known to generalize to this new scenario. And uh, the bounds we can derive by uh, quantum random oracle arguments are usually less tight than their classical counterparts. And now we'll zoom in into one of those properties I just mentioned, namely programmability. So now to say a few words about adaptive reprogramming in the quantum random oracle model. In the classical random oracle model, things are very easy. We can say if the random oracle has not been queried yet on a particular pre-image X, then uh, the attacker has no knowledge of uh, the value of this position and we can choose it on the fly. And this in particular means that reduction could um, uh, pick it in a way that's helpful to the reduction to simulate a particular security game without any secret knowledge, like for example, a secret key. It only has to um, make sure that the value is uniform and consistent with the rest of the view of the attacker. Uh, unfortunately, in the quantum random oracle model, things are not as easy. Mm. If we allow the attacker to pose superposition queries, then in principle, any query could already have contained X with some amplitude. And uh, checking whether uh, this was the case would have meant measuring the query, meaning um, altering the state and hence potentially disturbing the attacker. So an interesting question is, can we adaptively reprogram in the quantum random oracle model? And I'll mention right away that there has been previous work on this question, which will be discussed after we have presented our findings to make stuff uh, more comparable. So for the rest of the talk, I will first um, describe a motivational use case to convince you that this is actually a question that's worth tackling. And afterwards, um, I present to you our results and uh, show how these can be applied to the motivational use case. After that, uh, Chris will um, sketch to you the proof technique that we used and we'll finally show you that um, there's reason to believe that uh, the bound we derive is tight because we found a matching attack. But now let's first go to the motivating example, a use case in the classical random oracle model. And um, we decided to discuss fiat Shamir signatures. So this is a fiat Shamir signature scheme built from an uh, identification scheme and a hash function that will be modeled as a random oracle uh, to 
generate keys, we'll just use the key generation algorithm of the identification scheme. And to sign a message, we'll first use the commit algorithm of the identification scheme to derive a commitment and a state. And then the respond algorithm to define a response. And what's important is to notice that um, the challenge we will forward to the respond algorithm will be the hash value of the commitment we picked and the message. And the signature then uh, consists of the commitment and the response. To verify a message and a signature, we'll use uh, the ver verification algorithm of the identification scheme, again, relative to the challenge that is the hash value of the commitment and the message. And an important proof step to argue that Fiat is unforgeable, even if an attacker has access to a signing oracle, is to get rid of the signing oracle by arguing that if the identification scheme is honest verifier zero knowledge, meaning that identification transcripts can be simulated by a simulator that only has access to the public key, uh, then in the random oracle model, it holds that the signing algorithm can be simulated by a simulator that also does without the secret key. And the proof of the step goes as follows. Again, we want to show that if the identification scheme is on a verifier zero knowledge, then the signing algorithm can be simulated without the secret key. The idea is to simulate a signature using the honest verifier zero knowledge simulator by um, yeah, <laughs> picking a simulated transcript and letting the signature be the commitment and the response that was part of this transcript. But of course, this wouldn't be consistent with the attacker's view because the attacker would, uh, would expect that the challenge is the random oracle value. So what we do is that we program the random oracle a posteriori by setting it to challenge on the commitment and the message. And um, this simulation works unless this particular random oracle value has already been queried because then the attacker would notice that we uh, reprogrammed it. But this is pretty unlikely uh, given that the commitment has high enough entropy because the probability of this happening can be upper bounded in terms of the number of random oracle queries and the probability of this commitment happening. And this is once per signature. So all in all, in total, the distinguishing advantage between proper signatures and this uh, simulated signature, uh, these simulated signatures uh, can be upper bounded in terms of the advantage against our uh, honest verifier zero knowledge for uh, QS many um, transcripts where QS is the number of signing queries plus number of signing queries times number of Oracle queries times maximum probability of the commitments. Okay, what did we just see? We saw that we can uh, pretty much simplify security proofs for Fiat Shamir in the random Oracle model and we used that um, Reprogramming is triggered by queries to the signing oracle. And uh, what we want to take away here is that um, oracles like signing oracles or decryption oracles, meaning all oracles that um, represent honest users in the security game will remain classical even if we want to prove post-quantum security. So reprogramming was triggered by a classical query, and uh, we used that it's unlikely to query um, uh, the particular reprogramming position before the reprogramming happens. And now we want to take a look uh, at what happens quantumly. And there, it's not even so clear what uh, to um, what it means that uh, this particular position was not queried before the reprogramming. And we also have to consider that uh, we cannot simply check whether um, the oracle was queried on a particular position or not, because then 
it uh, might happen that we disturb the attacker. Now we'll move on to the results. And um, our results are a reprogramming toolbox. And first I present to you the simplest case just uh, to get you into it. And um, we uh, consider distinguishers that have a particular task, namely the task to distinguish between access to a plain random oracle and its adaptively reprogrammed uh, counterpart, which we call H1. So at the beginning of the game, A started with access to the original random oracle and the random oracle is defined on the product of uh, a finite set x1 and a finite set x2. Um, just imagine that we have some bit string of length 2L and x1 is the bit strings of length L and x2 is the second half. And um, after having queried uh, the original oracle for some time, a will pick its own position x1, which marks the first half of the position. And the game completes this position to a complete reprogramming position by uniformly picking x2 from the second set. And now we'll define h1 as h0, but reprogrammed on this position, meaning we let h1 coincide with h0 anywhere, but on this particular position. And on this position, we'll just uh, define it to be a new, freshly, uniformly random value. And um, the second half of uh, the reprogramming position will forward to A, and uh, then continue A with access to either H0 or H1. And the task of H, uh, the task of A is to tell uh, to which oracle it has access. So if we were in a classical world, things would be pretty easy, then the distinguishing advantage would be upper bounded in terms of the number of oracle queries and the size of X2, because uh, the reprogramming part that uh, wasn't under the control of A cannot be foreseen by A, meaning it will only have queried the oracle with this probability on this position. And uh, first nice result is that quantumly things don't look too different. So all we have to do is to add a square root and to multiply by a factor of one and a half. So this is kind of nice, <laughs> but it's not really very general because um, with this argument, we wouldn't be able to, for example, argue security of Fiat Shamir. So what we did was to generalize this result a bit. And um, I'll show you on the next slide how we generalized it. But before that, let me state that this bound is actually tight because we found a matching attack and this will be the last section of the talk. And now uh, onto the generalizations. So here we see the bound for the simple case we have just considered before. Now, a first important generalization is to reprogram many times because we don't just want to reprogram once, but for example, uh, as often as an attacker might issue um, signing queries. So if we want to reprogram R many times, uh, this bound has trivially to be multiplied by R because we can just give a hybrid. Another, uh, another more important generalization is that uh, we now let A pick the whole reprogramming position uh, instead of just the first half. And um, A is even allowed to uh, pick distributions according to which those reprogramming positions are picked uh, adaptively. So it might completely change distributions depending on its input. And uh, the resulting bound is in spirit very similar to what we've seen before. We just have to um, uh, replace uh, the term relative to the size of uh, the second half 
uh, with the maximal probability of any element to be drawn from any of those distributions. And the last generalization is um, a scenario in which these distributions also generate some additional information X prime, which will also be forwarded to A. Not only the reprogramming position, but also the site information will be forwarded to A. And this doesn't change the bound. So now I can uh, compare our results with what was previously known. Mm. There has been uh, some work before on this question, all resulting in essentially the same bound. But uh, none of these results considered arbitrary distributions that might be um, adaptively picked. They just considered the uniform distribution. And they also didn't consider site information that is forwarded to the attacker. Yes, and uh, all those bounds are for just one reprogramming incident and all bounds, uh, all results have in common that if you want to reprogram R many times, you have to multiply the bound by R. Okay, now I want to show you how we can use this result um, to prove that um, fiat Shamir signatures uh, can be simulated without the attacker noticing too much. And uh, the goal of uh, our approach is to use the same simulation that we have seen in the classical scenario. So here we see honest signatures as defined by the fiat Shamir transform. And before we move to simulating um, by um, honest verifier zero knowledge uh, transcripts, we'll do an intermediate simulation that is pretty st uh, straightforward. We will remove this step. We will not define the challenge to be the random oracle value of the commitment at the message anymore. Instead, we will um, choose it uniformly at random and then reprogram the random oracle accordingly. And uh, due to our theorems, we now know uh, that this is essentially unnoticeable if the um, commitment scheme has sufficiently uh, high entropy. And um, from this intermediate simulation, we can now go forward to the desired simulation where we simply draw a simulated transcript and program the random oracle accordingly. And this is justifiable by a straightforward honest verifier zero knowledge argument. Okay, and um, as we can see, the um, proof for this uh, this proof step for Fiat Shamir was as um, simple and straightforward as in the random oracle model. And um, yeah, our work again. <laughs> uh, contains uh, this this proof of your Shamir signatures that is conceptually simple and also uh, tighter than uh, the ones that were previously known. It also contains a tighter result for XMSS because we uh, give a, a tighter proof for hash and sign and the message compression routine of XMSS. And what we also did was to um, uh, take a look at work that uh, considered how to hedge fiat Shamir against real world attacks where um, hardware malfunctions are induced to derail the algorithms and um, to show how the work generalized to the quantum random oracle model, meaning that even uh, quantum attackers uh, will not have too much success uh, by inducing fault injection when attacking the head fiat Shamir transform. Okay, and with this, I say bye and let Chris talk about our proof technique. Hello, my name is Christian Mayens. And in this last part of the talk, I will um, give you a little bit of an idea about our proof technique and will present the matching uh, attack that uh, 
shows that our reprogramming lemma is tight. Um, we begin with a little sketch of the ROM proof. So in the, the rest of the talk, we will, for simplicity, leave out this adversarially chosen part of the input. Um, also, um, let's take the input and the output of the hash function to be equal to the end of strings, just for simplicity. So here is, again, uh, the game that the adversary is playing. Um, the first stage of the adversary gets to interact with the random oracle H. Then um, the random oracle H is uh, reprogrammed as some random input X star uh, to the random output y, y star, or not, depending on the bit B. And uh, finally, um, the adversary gets to uh, interact with the possibly reprogrammed oracle again to come up with a guess B prime for the bit B. Now, the distinguishing advantage of such an adversary that, that has classical access to H um, is upper bounded by the number of queries in the first phase divided by two to the N. This is um, fairly straightforward. So here's the intuition. Um, basically the adversary needs to resort to guessing B unless they have uh, queried X star in the first phase. Um, and therefore we can bound the, uh, the advantage by um, the expectation over the choice of X star of the probability that X star has been queried in the learning phase. This is a bit of a roundabout way to express this upper bound, but um, it will be helpful for the quantum proof. And this is more or less obviously bounded, bounded by the number of queries by 2 to the n. Now, uh, in the quantum random oracle model version of this, uh, this lemma, we use um, the superposition oracle technique. So I want to briefly explain what uh, the superposition oracle technique is. So essentially, the superposition oracle is something like a quantum function table of a random function. So again, for simplicity, let's look at an n bit to n bit random function. And here's a com comparison between the function table of a random oracle and uh, the superposition oracle. So this, the entire object, so the entire random oracle function table is just two to the n random variables, abstractly speaking, and the entire superposition oracle, that's just two to the n quantum registers. Now, in uh, the random oracle, an unqueried entry of the function table is just an independent, uniformly random random variable. On the other hand, in the superposition oracle, um, an unqueried entry just corresponds to a uniform superposition state. Now here is um, the ROM proof sketch again. Now let's try to mimic this in, uh, in the superposition oracle. So um, why does this ROM proof actually work? It works because um, an unqueried entry, as we've just seen, uh, corresponds to a uniformly ra random variable. So um, if X star has not been queried um, in the learning phase, then um, the corresponding output is a uniformly random variable. Uh, so replacing it with a fresh uniformly random string doesn't change anything. Now in the quantum random oracle model, we just use the superposition oracle and to reprogram instead of um, you know, sampling a new output, we prepare the register corresponding to the output at X star into a fresh uniform superposition state. Now, Essentially, we can repeat the proof that we have, or this proof sketch up, up there, except that we need to replace um, this expectation value by the expectation over x star of the probability that um, h of x star, the corresponding register, is not in the uniform superposition state, because that basically corresponds to the adversary having queried this input. Now, this expectation value over x star is put in quotation marks here, because um, somehow the argument, so this probability, is not well formed. We are talking about a quantum register, so we cannot talk about the probability that this quantum register is not in uniform superposition. Or in principle, we could talk about this probability, but it doesn't make any sense. So what we actually do is we handle this whole proof inside the quantum formalism, but I just don't, didn't want to discuss it here. So I think this expectation value in quotation marks is as close as you will get to um, getting an idea of the proof. Okay, so after um, this short kind of um, insight into our proof technique, let me um, present the matching attack that we have that shows that 
Um, the reprogramming lemma is uh, tight. So let's first have, have a look at a classical attack. Here's the, the theorem again that gives um, the upper bound on the distinguishing advantage. A simple attack is to just query Q different values of X, store all of the results, and then do this in the, in the first phase, right? And then um, in the second phase, just hope that um, the reprogrammed input is among the ones queried in the first phase. This costs Q queries in the first phase, but um, an important caveat is that the memory cost is order Q, right? Because we need to store all the values. So here's a better attack. We can just store the XOR of all the query outputs and then recompute them in the second phase and compare the two um, checksums. This costs two Q queries because we need to query all of the inputs again in the second phase. But on the other hand, the memory cost is um, order one. Now, what we do is we quantize the better attack. Um, so how does that work? Yeah, let's first have a look at when the classical attack succeeds. So here, the attack succeeds whenever the reprogrammed input x star is in the set of great inputs. And that obviously is the case with probability q times 2 to the minus n. Now, the idea is to query a superposition of different sets of inputs. And um, then some of the success probability should actually grow with um, what one could call the amplitude of x star being in the query set uh, instead of the probability. And that's how we uh, gain the square root advantage. So more concretely, how can we do this efficiently? We start with a uniform superposition of inputs. Then we repeatedly do the following. We query um, our superposition. And then we apply some fixed cyclic permutation of um, the domain of our hash function. Um, that we, we do that Q times. And then after reprogramming, we undo the whole thing. Now, if we're back with it in the initial state, then uh, nothing has happened. And if uh, something has changed, um, then, then reprogramming has happened. And there is, is an optimal measurement that gives us this square root advantage. This reveals basically the, the, the theorem that uh, says that our reprogramming theorem is tight, or in other words, the, the distinguishing advantage of order square root of the number of quer Oracle queries divided by 2 to the n is achievable. That was all we wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening.